So welcome everyone to the sixth and last uh, final session of the Social Media Labs Computational Social Science Bootcamp. So as Philip mentioned, we have a busy schedule for today, and I hope we have a bit more time for just general research discussions at the end. Uh, if um, you're just joining us for the first time, uh, the bootcamp is hosted by the Social Media Lab at the Ted Rogers School of Management here at Ryerson University in Toronto. And the lab studies uh, how social media changes the way people and organizations use social media to share information, connect and collaborate. Um, I'm Anatoly Grust, professor and Canada Research Chair at Ryerson University. And the event is co-hosted um, together with the uh, lab's co-director, Philip Mai. And um, as Philip mentioned, we have a um, special appearance of Tiago Robier, who is a data scientist at the lab, will be presenting on one of the topics um, for today. All of the recordings and slides are posted to the bootcamps uh, page on Communalytic, as well as on the Social Media Labs page. And uh, I believe Tiago will um, kindly share some of the links that you will see on this slide deck, so you don't have to Google them. Uh, but like I said, the slide deck will be shared uh, um, by Monday on the community website, so you have access to all of them, all of the links. Three topics we're going to cover today. First one, we'll start with data collection using CrowdTangle platform, which allows us uh, to access public and popular Facebook pages, uh, groups, and Instagram accounts. Uh, then we'll talk about something called two-mode semantic networks. It's a type of a network representation that we can apply to data sets coming from CrowdTangle and other platforms. So I'll tell you more about uh, why it might be useful to represent data in this format and how we can do it using Communalytic. And finally, for the last bonus topic for today, we'll talk about uh, social bot detection, specifically in the context of uh, Twitter. Uh, and Tiago will present how we incorporated Batometer API uh, system into Communalytic, which essentially makes it easier for you to estimate if a particular account in your Twitter dataset is uh, automated or not. Let's start with the first topic and talk about CrowdTangle a little bit. This is a Facebook platform online tool that essentially provides access to publicly available and popular posts um, shared on Facebook, uh, on Facebook pages, Facebook groups, uh, or, or via verified accounts. And so both on Facebook and Instagram. And they also incorporated access to additional um, platforms, some Twitter search as well as Reddit search. Uh, but let's focus specifically on uh, Facebook, access to Facebook and Instagram public posts, because this is the only uh, really tool so far that allows us researchers to have access to uh, some kind of publicly available data on, on Facebook and Instagram. According to the documentation, uh, the CrowdTangle platform covers uh, Facebook, so posts by public Facebook pages. Uh, with more than 25,000 likes of followers, so very popular pages. It also includes posts by public Facebook groups with very large memberships. And it's um, internationally with groups uh, that included 95,000 or more members, or for the US-based public groups with 2,000 or more members. Uh, and how do they know if it's US-based groups? It's usually determined by the uh, administrators of the, the countries of the page ad, the group's administrators. They also include posts by verified profiles on Facebook. With Instagram, uh, they include public Instagram accounts with more than 50,000 followers, like super influencers, as well as verified accounts. So you may ask me, what are the verified accounts? So it's very similar to what you might have seen on Twitter, um, where an account will get, in this case, a blue check mark. And um, it has to be, there are some uh, criteria for account to be verified on Facebook or Instagram. So it, it has to be authentic. So essentially representing a real person or brand complete, meaning that all the profile information filled, it has to be unique. And the person has to be essentially famous or highly searched for or a brand. Um, the reason I'm focusing so much on the coverage for the crowd tangle, because we do need to understand as researchers, what types of data we we actually analyze it. 
So CrowdTangle uh, provides this um, table to also give us an idea overall coverage of uh, what they offer us to search uh, within versus what's out there on Facebook. So if we're looking at the Facebook pages specifically, and you're only interested in studying content, uh, public posts by pages uh, with more than 50,000 followers or likes, and then you essentially cover and you study in the whole, full universe of all these pages, 99, they estimate 0.83%. Not sure where they, you know, point, uh, 13% are hiding, uh, but that's that's the coverage. It could be maybe pages created recently uh, or became popular recently and wasn't indexed at the time. Um, but if you're actually trying to generalize your results based on the whole Facebook popular page population, uh, you probably cannot because it only constitutes the crowd tunnel coverage for Facebook pages only constitutes 1.72%. So it does tell us that uh, CrowdTangle is a good platform if you if your research uh, interested in studying popular pages, uh, influencers, or brands. Uh, until uh, recently, the access to CrowdTangle was limited to um, invited uh, individuals, brands, uh, journalists. Uh, but since last year, we see the platforms been opened up, and there's a uh, standardized process for researchers like yourself to apply to have access to it. We included the link and it's also posted in the chat room here where you can apply to get access, free access to this platform if you study in misinformation, election doing election related research, COVID-19 related research, uh, or if your research focuses on rac racial justice or well-being in general. Um, once you have uh, granted access to the platform, and this is a screenshot from uh, our account uh, from the lab, where you'll see, so first of all, you do need to have a Facebook account to sign into the platform, just keep that in mind. But once you logged in, you see this kind of search interface where you can uh, search for public posts within that coverage universe that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and you can use Boolean operators, you know, like in this case, uh, I'm looking for any posts that mention COVID or COVID-19 or COVID-19, coronavirus or pandemic. And keep in mind, uh, unlike Twitter, for Facebook, uh, what I noticed, you do have to provide all variations of spellings of certain words. Uh, so for Twitter, if you just include COVID, it will match uh, posts with all the variations like COVID-19, COVID-19. For Facebook, search for crowd angle specifically, you have to spell it out. There are additional filter options you can use. You can say whether you're interested in searching within Facebook or Instagram only. Uh, then you specify if it's a Facebook, whether you want to focus on Facebook posts by Facebook pages or posts within Facebook groups and so on. Uh, it does offer you access to historical data for the um, covered pages and groups. Uh, you can limit your search by post types, whether it's uh, uh, only posts that includes links to YouTube, for example, or only posts with pictures and so on. Uh, if you're interested in studying specific uh, pages or groups or verify profile, you can limit uh, your search by that. Uh, there's a language filter option because Facebook automatically detects language of posts. So you can uh, limit your data collection depending on what you're planning to study. Um, there is some posts uh, that are in partnership with brands. You can limit uh, to only study those branded, the branded content or only within verified accounts. And uh, there are some uh, location-based limitations. And more recently, they added uh, meme search, which is uh, essentially what happens. Uh, they parse, they process images shared on Facebook or Instagram. And if it's text embedded in the image, uh, you can search within that. Once you figure out what you're searching for, uh, you can try it, you know, repeat to refine your search criteria. Uh, it will show you the, the general distribution of number of posts per day. Uh, here we see, for example, I searched for uh, COVID related posts uh, in the database since the beginning of the pandemic. You can see there's a spike in uh, interactions on Facebook, public Facebook with um, estimated 31 billion interactions um, and 270 six million posts in what we can ac have access to for this topic. And you can see the interactions slowly decline over, over the year, over the, uh, the last year, and then became stable. You can view the post. You can also click on individual posts or pages to see the level of engagement, so react uh, level, how many people are 
reacted to certain posts and so on. The tool is really uh, good for data collection and general exploration of uh, viral content. Uh, it doesn't uh, include uh, specific um, types of analysis that we as researchers might want to run. So what uh, you would more likely to do is you would want to export the data set that you've collected via CrowdTangle um, to analyze it with other tools. And that's what we're gonna focus on today. So the CrowdTangle allows you to uh, download as to request CSV, and you already familiar with comma separated value files because this is what community also uses for their uh, for our expert features. But anyway, so CrowdTangle allows you to export CSVs in batches of uh, up to three hundred thousand uh, posts. Um, I do suggest to limit. You can specify how many records per CSV file you can include, uh, so it's a bit more manageable. And you can limit it by changing the time frame or other filter options. So uh, let's say you exported uh, your data set from CrowdTangle to your computer as a CSV file. They'll send you an email to download it. Uh, and so now you can use uh, uh, any kind of scripts or research tools like Community to analyze. It. If you, let's say, want to run toxicity analysis with this data set, so you want to get it into com your Community account. So how do you do that? First option would be, of course, to just use the import CSV file option in Community. Uh, just keep in mind, that's the easiest, I guess, option most straightforward. Uh, keep in mind that there's a limit 10 megabytes per uh, import file for the EDU version and 100 megabytes for the pro version on Community. You can um, work around that limit by compressing your CSV files because they're text files, they quite you can comp compress them quite well. Uh, and the compression that Community supports is called gzip. So gzip extension. So most of the compression tools uh, uh, supports that type of uh, compression. So you can upload it essentially gzip files and Community will understand that. Another option uh, to make it easier if you already have CrowdTangle account to work with CrowdTangle, we directly implemented CrowdTangle URL search API which essentially allows you to uh, search for public Facebook or Instagram posts uh, that shared a specific URL or a link to a website. And that could be a URL to a specific news story, for example, you know, New York Times published something about the pandemic and you want to know what people said about this uh, particular story, or it could be a, uh, any post uh, linking to a particular domain name. So the interface, the way it looks or in community, essentially, where you hit CrowdTangle import, you'll see you familiar fields. So you first give a name to a data set. Uh, then you copy and paste the actual URL or domain name with HTTPS or HTTP, depending on what page uses, uh, to the second field. Then there's a drop-down menu where you specify whether you're searching for Facebook or Instagram posts and specify the time period. This is historical data collection, so it's not uh, going to collect going forward, but you can specify the data what's already there. Then you start collection. And so, for example, uh, you can search uh, if there's a new story about a possible side effect of the Pfizer BioNTech COVID 19 vaccine, like example on this slide. You can take this URL and search for it. You will find all different uh, Facebook. Um, posts uh, that mentioned linked that URL as part of the post. And so normally, again, this is just a screenshot of a, a CSV file that if you open in Excel, you would see um, you know, the post ID, the date when the post was made on Facebook or Instagram or when it was updated, uh, then the ma message itself, and then the link to the post, original post and authors and so on. Something to note before we're going forward uh, for uh, further with this data set from CrowdTangle is that for privacy reasons, when you export out posts from CrowdTangle, uh, even though the posts are public in these popular pages, um, if, if the post made within a public group and when you export it out, the author of the message will be the group name, not the actual Facebook user who posted the message within the group, but it will be the name of the group where the message appeared. So just keep that, keep that in mind. And also it does not export any comments 
made in response to those posts. So you cannot really have the study conversational uh, data as we, we did, for, for example, for Reddit uh, data sets or Twitter threads. Sample research questions you can ask with this URL ba based search specifically. If you're using this Crowd Angle API via community, you can, for example, identify signs of possible coordination among, um, you know, maybe seemingly desperate uh, dis disconnect disconnected accounts on platforms like Facebook and Instagram. So essentially, you can, when you search for posts who share the specific link, you then see are these entities somehow connected or not. Um, you can also look at who's sharing URLs to what we call low credibility websites, those that are known to, sh uh, to spread uh, misinformation and disinformation on topics. To help you kind of formulate your research questions, you might want to uh, use additional tools that help you discover um, what um, news stories are circulating on different topics. Uh, so for example, this uh, free database me is called Media Cloud that's supported by a number of uh, research institutions in the US. Um, and the link is here. So you can actually type keywords in this platform and it will return a list of URLs to different news stories. And you can limit it uh, your search within this media cloud plat online platform by country as well. So that's quite useful or by, um, by a political biases of certain media um, channels. So for example, you can search for uh, COVID related coverage uh, among uh, right leaning um, newspapers and other media outlets in the US. So once you have URLs, then you can decide, well, which of these you want to examine, which of them got most attention, and then where you go and do this crowd tangle search based on a specific URL. Some uh, research papers published recently uh, also use uh, other data databases of um, media um, websites. Uh, that known to share misinformation. So there is a database by organization called NewsGuard. This one is not free. You have to kind of subscribe, or if your institution has subscription, to have access to what they say that, the, that their database includes uh, over six thousand um, kind of domain names and rankings. How how credible a particular website is for the the news they share. So some papers combine that database and then search and on Facebook or Twitter to see who sharing certain websites, links, links to certain websites that are known to share misinformation. So there are multiple combinations. You can use multiple tools to decide what URLs or domain names you want to examine that people share. So you can do direct on CrowdTangle and then uh, as I showed you, import and export your data set into community. Or if you want to have a direct search for convenience, uh, you need to get API keys similarly to what you did for Twitter or for prospective API to run toxicity. So where do you find API keys uh, in your CrowdTangle account? So when you sign in, there's a settings button. And under the, that button, there will be kind of drop down menu and a link to API access. That's what you want to click. And that will give you um, multiple, you know, a long uh, text, uh, textual key that you're gonna copy to your uh, computer and then paste it into community in your account on community under the My Profiles page. Once it's there, you can do the direct, you can conduct direct search uh, via community. Uh, just to demonstrate how it works and what else you can do with data sets from CrowdTangle within community, I'll use the same example that I mentioned earlier. Uh, all of the Facebook, public Facebook po posts indexed by CrowdTangle that share the news story about this possible side effect, uh, supposedly, of Pfizer BioNTech uh, COVID 19 vaccine. And so the story was, uh, uh, was popular in December when the vaccines were national vaccination campaigns launched in many countries. And so you saw kind of a spike in misinformation about um, some of the uh, side effects uh, or inefficient in how COVID-19 vaccine might have not been as effective as predicted. And so if you're interested in studying who is engaged with this type of uh, stories that may be potentially misleading in some cases or outright false, so you can um, search using CrowdTangle URL search, you type, copy and paste the URL 
to this news story. Uh, the, it chose the platform and time range. So in this case, I chose early in 2021. So once the data is collected, uh, it will appear in your account under my data sets. In this case, and this wasn't the most popular story that's been circulating at the time, at least not from this news um, organization. So I only found 151 posts, but this is good for demonstration purposes. Um, in addition to doing the more you know, basic uh, exploratory data analysis, we've seen that many times, looking at the number of posts over time, who are the most engaged uh, accounts. In this case, those will be Facebook pages, uh, accounts or verified accounts, and general keyword cloud, which you can export out as a frequency table. Uh, so in addition to, we also include what we call reaction uh, box plugs, because Facebook in the data set provides uh, the number of uh, likes, shares, comments, and other reactions that people made on this individual posts. Uh, so if we're visualizing that as a, as a you know, common box plot, which shows you kind of median uh, uh, outliers and uh, mean for each reaction, gives you a general level of engagement with a particular uh, news story. Uh, and again, one of the advantages, of course, you might want to import data sets from Cloud Tangle into community that now you can actually assess the level of toxicity towards a particular news story or news event or a website using Prospective API, as we showed you earlier. Uh, so you can run that. Um, but what else can you do with data sets from Cloud Tangle? So this actually brings us to the second topic where I'm going to introduce so-called two-mode semantic networks and how to use them in conjunction with data from CrowdTangle, but also maybe with some other data sets from Twitter and other platforms. Before I go further, any questions about CrowdTangle in general, or specifically how you would go about incorporating them in your research? So if you have any questions, feel free to use your mic or just type your question into the chat room. So I see a hand, Dina, go ahead. Yeah, so Anatoly, can you please uh, uh, elaborate on what you mean by identify signs of uh, the type of same research topics that you can get is to identify signs of possible coordination among Facebook and Instagram groups? Yeah, this actually will be most visible uh, when we uh, you know, dive into the two mode semantic networks. The idea essentially to see uh, you know, who is sharing a particular link, a particular URL. So that's, you can do it with just general search. Uh, but then you want to try to uh, also examine and understand whether those accounts, you would expect them to share the same links, where, whether they, what positioning they have uh, towards that story, whether they both, you know, all of the groups support a particular point of view or against it. Um, so there is no particular metric necessarily that um, community or other tools can tell you that. Uh, something you will have to define as part of your kind of research. Journey. And can you look up for more than one link or it's one link per search? So for now, we we limit it. It's the API call is limited to searching by one URL, but we actually, by seeing what's published out there in this type of research where people want to search uh, right away for multiple URLs that maybe represent multiple misleading news stories. We're actually working on that feature to allow people to to incorporate multiple URLs. So that's coming later this year. Yeah, for now, within Community, you can search one uh, URL at a time, and same with CrowdTangle. OK, thank you. Yeah. All right, so I'll continue on. But if you have other emerging questions, feel free to wait till the uh, Q&A at the end, or just use the chat room, and I will address them as they arrive. So related to the question that Dina asked me about, you know, how do you actually go about trying to identify possible connections between Facebook actors when we actually don't have uh, friendship uh, connections information and we don't actually have with the CrowdTangle data, we don't know who replies to whom. 
uh, information and a lot of it's stripped due to the privacy concerns, of course. Uh, but there are some ways uh, by looking at the content people share on Facebook uh, to identify whether they have same positioning uh, towards a particular news story because they might be using same keywords uh, when they share same links. Uh, or different keywords. So let me demonstrate these two mode semantic networks that we're trying to um, kind of explore its use in this type of research. You might have heard of, so we already talked about communication networks in one of our previous sessions where you have a network of actors and connections often will represent interactions, uh, reply to, for example, interactions or retweet interactions. Um, you might have also heard uh, about semantic networks. We haven't covered them in this uh, series, but uh, the idea of, for semantic networks, essentially you uh, connect frequently used uh, words in your data set uh, by, uh, and the connection will represent the two words or two phrases often core peer in the same sentence or same message. So those are pure, uh, what we call semantic networks. So what we're trying to pioneer here is this hybrid um, a model where we call it two mode semantic networks, meaning that uh, there are two types of nodes. Two modes refer to two types of nodes in the network. And in our case, the first type of the nodes in the network will be Facebook or Instagram accounts. We will refer to them as actor nodes. And the second type of the nodes in the network that you will see will be semantic networks, uh, nodes. And semantic uh, nodes, in our case, will be represented using named entities. So named entity uh, is the kind of technical term uh, often used by researchers uh, in the natural language processing to refer to uh, any uh, you know, names for people, organizations, brands, events, or names for locations. So any kinds of names uh, that may be mentioned in text, they would be referred to named entities. And so we use them as a way to derive what the message is about, who, who this message is about, uh, for example. And so for the first step in this two-step process, when we are discovering two mode semantic networks, we want to kind of identify all of the actor nodes. And that's a very straightforward process because all we do is essentially was, we'll take the usernames of all of the accounts that posted messages in the given data set. So that's easy. So that's the actor node. In this example of a single Facebook post by CNN Politics account, the actor node will be CNN Politics. Um, the second step to identify second type of nodes, as I mentioned, semantic nodes. So all of the named entities mentioned in the messages by CNN Politics. So in this case, uh, we can see there's a named entity, Donald Trump, referring to the former president. Uh, there is a named entity of the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic. So you have two named entities. Now, during the second uh, step of the uh, network discovery here, we need to discover how different accounts are, uh, and semantic nodes connected. Uh, so essentially we will represent it as a mentions network where we link actor nodes that mention specific en named entities. So in this case, CN po CNN politics, actor node, I mentioned Donald Trump. So we're going to link CNN politics to Donald Trump's account, uh, not account, but um, semantic node, uh, and the COVID-19 pandemic. So those are two uh, name entities that mentioned by this account. In the real data set, you're going to have multiple posts. And so the process will be repeated automatically, of course, uh, to get a better sense of what accounts mention what uh, name entities. How do we discover name entities? So that's an important uh, kind of methodological uh, insight that if you are relying on this approach, you need to be able to explain how that's happening. So Communalytic relies on a well-developed uh, natural language processing library. It's called uh, Spacey. Uh, this is a Python-based library um, that allows us to essentially take a text, uh, in our case, posts uh, from your data set and uh, automatically process on our side um, um, to identify named entities in the text. Depending on what language uh, your text is, um, it will uh, always, so essentially, sorry, regardless of the language, regardless of the language your data set is, it um, should discover personal names, organizational names, 
or names of natural landmarks or locations. So that's regardless of the language. If your data set is in English, and that's something that we identify automatically, if it's not provided by platform already. So, but if it's English, uh, Spacey is actually able to uh, add additional granular types of name entities, uh, such as geographical names not included in the previous category. So that could be country, city names, products, name of the uh, inanimate objects or work of art. It could be a title of an artwork or book, for example, references to nationalities, religious or political groups, physical infrastructures, so the name of the building on the road, the bridge, uh, referring to legal documents or legislations, some um, you know, names of activities, events, uh, or references to specific language. So that's essentially happening on the back end when you hit analyze and discover to mode network, it will process all of your messages to discover references to this. And then it will connect all the actor nodes, the posters uh, of these messages to those semantic nodes that have been mentioned. Uh, in terms of uh, why we chose Sp Spacey to use for name entity detection, there are many libraries uh, and algorithms that can do that, name entity detection. We chose Spacey because it supports multiple languages. So that was important for us because many of you are analyzing data sets in different languages, but also Spacey publishes uh, their accuracy measures. Um, and so we like some of the results they publish. So for English models, essentially the level of accuracy gets 85, uh, so 86, 85%, depending on what measure you look at precision or recall, uh, which is pretty good, I should say. It's a bit lower for um, Japanese or Chinese uh, language. It's just much harder to identify name entities. Uh, but this multilingual model, uh, so if you're trying to analyze a data set in language that is not supported by Spacey, what, we, what Cumulatic does essentially, it automatically will apply this multilingual model. And multilingual model uh, produces uh, highly accurate results, 84% or 83%, depending on what metric you look at. Uh, but it's not 100% as with, uh, this is machine learning approaches, uh, we probably shouldn't expect 100%, but it means that you might need some data cleaning after this process. So don't, don't assume that all the named entities discovered are 100% named entities. So there may be some uh, false positive or noise in this data. And so now this is a kind of general visual representation of two mode network. So what you might expect is you're gonna see a lot of uh, uh, nodes with a lot of semantic uh, nodes because these are named entities mentioned by multiple posts. And the larger data set, the more named entities you're gonna see in the visualization. And I'll, and I'll show you how in Communalytic and Gephi, you can actually reduce the complexity of this uh, type of networks. Uh, but other nodes not displayed here, but represented in different colors. Sorry, nodes are displayed here, the labels are not. Uh, they represent uh, Facebook um, pages or groups or verified accounts that mentioned that mentioned specific topics or specific named entities. And that's how by looking at the clustering of those accounts around certain named entities, you can start judging, and I'll show you one example of the, based on this data set, how you can start judging what is the perspectives uh, of different actors in this network. Uh, are they all talking about the same name entities? Are they you know, developing different narratives around same news story, essentially. So let's see how first we can do that in community. So once you have a data set um, that you collected from Crowd Dangle and or any actually any other data sets, community now can build name um, two mode uh, semantic networks for any data sets. You would click on network analysis in your my data sets view, and then you have. Um, two options for uh, data sets from Reddit and Community, you can build reply to networks just like we showed you before. But now you'll have an option to build these two mode semantic networks that I just introduced. For CrowdTangle, uh, I did mention, um, just want to remind you again, there is no who replies to whom information. Uh, so the option uh, just for consistency will be there, but it will say it's not available for CrowdTangle type of data sets. So here we cho choose two mode semantic network chosen by default, hit generate network. There's a progress bar uh, the process is happening on, on our server. 
so you don't have to stare at your screen, you can close it. Um, depending on how large your data set is, it may take a couple minutes, a couple hours. Uh, you can always check the progress. Once it's ready, you'll see four buttons. Visualize network, uh, downloaded network as a graph ML, as a Getty, and reset network file. Uh, I'll show you what happens when you visualize in it, how to specifically navigate through our built-in visualizer for this type of networks. Uh, and then I'll show you how you can export, export the data set, either as a GraphML file or Gephi file to visualize it in Gephi. Just keep in mind, if uh, you have a very large data set and there are more than 100,000 uh, 100, edges, uh, we're actually not able to produce uh, visualization due to the uh, you know, require, requirements for computing resources, but we will generate GraphML files. So you can always download GraphML file for uh, networks larger than 100 with uh, more than 100, 100,000 edges. And then you can use Gephi or other tools to uh, explore it further. Uh, the reset network file is uh, necessary if you, for example, collected your data set and you want to visualize it as a network right away. But then later on, you want to add toxicity scores to your network visualizations, and then you want to display it on the screen. So you will have to hit reset network file and re reanalyze network after you finish the toxicity uh, analysis. Or if you want to switch between reply to networks for Twitter or Reddit datasets to, to mode network, uh, semantic networks, you also will have to use this reset network file to switch between different network types. So let me quickly show you uh, what happens when you're trying to visualize two mode semantic networks. Uh, we customize our network uh, visualizer that you can use within your browser without installing additional software to specifically visualize, represent semantic nodes as these black star-shaped nodes. So you can clearly see the difference between actor nodes and the, the semantic nodes in your network. Uh, other interface features are quite similar to what you already have seen for communication networks. So let's say we have the control panel on the right side, which will first tell you the network properties uh, of this network. Uh, it will start by showing how many actor nodes you have. In my case, I had 144 accounts. Um, then number of semantic nodes, uh, 115 uh, semantic nodes were detected from, from this data set and the number of edges linking actor nodes to semantic nodes. Uh, you can uh, try to improve uh, the, you know, reduce the complexity and improve the clarity of this visualization by running an additional network layout algorithm. We talked about layout algorithms um, previously, but just to demonstrate how an additional layout may help in the semantic networks, I clicked on run for three seconds button it's an additional force-directed force layout that we um, implemented here as part of the visualization. You can run it, and what it does, it kind of spreads uh, clusters very nicely. Essentially, you, now you can much clearly see uh, the black nodes, the star-shaped nodes, semantic nodes, that are sur surrounded by many uh, round circles. Those are Facebook accounts. So you can clearly see that many accounts will uh, mention certain name entities, but you can also see on the periphery, there are some clusters or star-shaped configurations, I should say, around in a single or few, only few accounts. Um, so for example, when you see this uh, configuration, one a Facebook account surrounded by many semantic nodes, that means that it's either a person uh, or um, you know page or group posted a, a long message uh, where we extracted detected many name entities. So maybe not as informative, you probably can ignore it. Or maybe it's a spammer uh, or other active poster that posts many messages. So as a result, uh, the, they will be surrounded, surrounded by semantic nodes. But what's important that when people share this URL, this link to this news story about possible side effects for this vaccine, nobody else used the same keywords as this person on the periphery. So that's something to note as well. Versus here, even though these three accounts, Facebook accounts are on the periphery, uh, all three of them share the same keywords. It's possible that they shared uh, the same post, uh, 
to the same uh, news story. So there is some kind of uh, linkages between these three accounts. And that's something um, uh, we mentioned earlier that may be a sign of possible uh, coordination. And when we say coordination, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that accounts or individuals or groups actually, uh, you know, saying, okay, I tweeted something or I posted something on Facebook, go ahead and repost it. For partisan networks, it uh, happens quite often naturally. Pe people and groups follow each other. So as soon as some relevant uh, news story started trending or posted, they would reshare, all of them would reshare. So, so when we say possible coordination, it doesn't have to be a, a explicit coordination necessarily, but it does help us to find uh, affiliations. Uh, also, this type of networks can help us find uh, accounts that share this same story, but maybe in different languages. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this cluster on the top right corner, where you see uh, keywords like uh, Poodle China, Vac China. And I'll show you an example of why that's happening. So essentially indicating some of the accounts that maybe share the same URL, but maybe using different language or different focus, different narrative. Now, further to reduce the complexity of this network, because two mode semantic networks can get very busy, especially as your data set grows, uh, you might want to say, hey, uh, we only want to see uh, nodes that are, or semantic nodes that are mentioned by at least two or at least five, in my case, five or more um, other nodes. So for that purposes, we go to node and edge filters in Cumulative Visualizer. And I just slide this uh, bar to five. In my case, you can really adjust based on your configuration. And all of the other nodes kind of disappears. And what I see here uh, are only semantic nodes that are mentioned by five or more other social actors. So those are more prevalent uh, topics or themes that emerge from this data set. And it does uh, kind of highlight uh, advantage of looking at two mode semantic networks versus just just semantic networks because we preserved some uh, social um, kind of potential social interactions uh, and in this network if you're just looking at semantic network uh, what will happen essentially if i use a pen um, the colorful nodes representing facebook accounts will disappear and all you're going to see the black color nodes are shared topics, which is informative. It will tell you uh, uh, things like, well, there are multiple themes emerge around this topic or around this URL. But um, when we're preserving linkages between who mentioned what uh, in this data set, we also can see clusters of accounts uh, that use the same terms in the context of the same news story or the same link into the same website. So that's the added, added advantage. Uh, so, for example, the central uh, cluster here around uh, name entities like uh, US FDA, Food and Drug Administration in the US, uh, the Pfizer and the word Bell, referring to the name of this uh, potential side effect uh, for this, um, uh, for the vaccine. So they all essentially, they central because it is core of this news story. And so most of the accounts that shared on Facebook, this new story would use combination of these keywords in their messages. So that's something kind of confirm, 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 confirming what you might have expect to see. But then you're looking at uh, other formation, like the one I pointed out earlier, where you have a group of accounts around words like Vax, Vax, Vax China, uh, uh, Poodle China. And when we look at the, some of the messages that generated that cluster configuration, they were in, um, in Chinese, uh, so Facebook allows you to auto translate um, the message, and that's the what I'm showing here. It's auto translated example. Uh, essentially, the narrative was that hey, if a Pfizer vaccine uh, already have this major side effect um, uh, that causes uh, partial paralysis of the face, and that was an, a proven side effect. Uh, but the narrative is that hey, if Pfizer has that major side effect, then what can you expect from Chinese vaccine? Kind of that that's the narrative was being pushed by those groups uh, how can you well you may ask me anatoly how do you get uh, um, how can you read the messages that were generated by certain clusters so we try to address that uh, to add the interactivity to the network 
uh, visualization. So you can click on any of these nodes in the network to see the uh, related messages, either those that mention certain semantic words or are from certain accounts. So for example, if I mouse over and click on account um, for the group called uh, Vaccine Accountability and Transparency, so there's a blue node, so I clicked, um, and it shows me immediately when you click on one of the nodes, it will hide all of the nodes and only display uh, direct uh, connections. In this case, uh, there uh, will display connections to named entities that are mentioned by posts within from this group. And in this case, these are the common words you would expect just about news story. So there's nothing um, unique about it. So you might want to just uh, review on the right side. In the control panel under the post section, you can review the messages that are from this group mentioned in this, um, this particular two name entities. And what you can see here, essentially, it says two from uh, this group. And you can see this is the identical message. So what happens, it was just one message from this group uh, that generated two semantic um, nodes here. If you want to um, view uh, essentially messages that mention a specific name entity by multiple groups, you click on the star shape node and the same approach applies here under the posts. It shows that there are 81 uh, different messages that mention Pfizer by all these different groups that are directed connect, directly connected to this uh, semantic node. You can use um, kind of a small uh, button here, uh, right here, to view how this message looked like on Facebook if it's still available. So you just clicked on it and a new window will pop up with the actual message. So in this case, I clicked on it and it shows um, uh, this, this, this message about uh, the news a new story shared by this within this group, coronavirus news Malta. Uh, on the other hand, because there are eighty one messages, uh, you might want to highlight where a particular message um, appeared in this network, and each message corresponds to a particular edge, right? Dimensions. So you can actually click visualization allows you to click on any of the messages anywhere, and it will highlight the corresponding edge in this orange bold color showing the direction. So again, those are features uh, built into the visualizer to help you uh, first reduce the complexity of two mode semantic networks because they can get very busy. You need to be able to isolate noise and focus on main clusters. And second uh, feature that allows you kind of zoom in and access the messages related to different uh, conversations or different clusters. Any quick question about the visualizer itself built in? Um, I'll wait for, for a couple seconds if you have questions. And then next, I will just quickly show you how you can continue your network examination of semantic network, two mode semantic networks in Gephi. So I see questions from uh, Talia. Uh, are the nodes only uh, groups, or also pages and verify profiles? Uh, yes, all three. So they can represent um, Facebook pages, uh, groups, or verify profiles, yeah, all three. Yeah, we don't limit. In CrowdTangle, you can use filter to limit it, but we collect all of them. We did notice, though, that um, most of the news stories, if you look for posts mentioning a particular news story, you're not going to get a huge data set. Um, so you do want to find news stories that went viral if you're looking for this wide, um, looking for wide dis uh, popular discussions around popular news stories. Uh, you can also look for, if you know a website, a specific domain name that's uh, known to share misinformation, for example, if that's your research, you can just type, search for posts mentioning that domain, regardless of the uh, news story. Uh, the question from Dana about is there a way to edit the results of the name entity detection? If it doesn't work uh, for a specific uh, language, yes. So let me show you. Thank you um, for that question, uh, Dana. I'm, I'll show you how you can do it in Gephi. So there's no feature in Cumulic uh, to, to 
kind of remove a false positive results for net, uh, or combine, but you can do it in Gephi, a free social network analysis tool that you can download to your computer uh, and it works for Mac and uh, Windows machines. Uh, so first you wanna download two mode semantic networks from community as a graph ML or Gephi file. And I'm gonna go here quickly. We will share a slide so you can kind of repeat the steps uh, what you see here. But I want to be mindful of time because we uh, promised this session to be one hour and a half. Um, and I still want us to talk about bad detection that Tiago will present. So let me just quickly go through uh, screenshots from Gephi, give you an idea what you can do, and then you can repeat it on your own. So you open the file, either GraphML or Gephi file um, in, in Gephi. Um, uh, then you can apply additional layout algorithms similar to Communalytic. Uh, Gephi has more options. Uh, this is an example of the same network, just using um, two different layouts. So you want to choose the one that uh, reduces a number of overlapping edges. Um, you can also change additional feature in Gephi. You can change the size of the node to either represent in degree, the number of incoming edges or out degree for two mode semantic networks. The connections are going from actor nodes to semantic nodes. So the larger nodes based on in degree uh, will be semantic nodes because all of the actor nodes will have in degree of zero, um, just how this network is built. But in, if you do want to get, find out actor uh, nodes that uh, share a lot of posts or mention a lot of semantic nodes, you can change the size of the nodes to represent out degree or uh, Facebook uh, data set or Instagram that allows you to see number of subscribers count. For example, here we see one uh, node in particular uh, that has a lot of subscribers. And then we can examine what semantic nodes, what um, name entities they mention. Now, the most useful feature, I think, when you export uh, this type of networks in Gephi, you can actually change the color of the nodes to represent different node types. In community, we sh use shapes to represent, to uh, kind of separate semantic nodes, which we represent as a black a star shaped nodes versus other nodes with circular. Well, here you use colors to represent different node types. And you have access to additional uh, metadata that we generated automatically, uh, where you have um, for Facebook, it there's a differentiation whether it's Facebook group or Facebook page. So you can change the color for those nodes. And for name entities, uh, you can actually see uh, or filter out those name entities that you're most interested in. If it's people's names you're interested, uh, you can keep that organizational names, locations, and so on. So that's another way to reduce complexity by excluding certain name entities from your network that you're not interested in. And uh, now you can uh, show all of the labels. It's going to be very busy. Uh, so you just click well, this. T in the toolbar at the bottom usually appears in Gephi, uh, but uh, we can scale the labels to the size of the nodes. So that's really helps with the visualization. You can see that. So this way, label size corresponds to node size. And you can do it by going to the appearances tab here and selecting the, you want to change appearances for the nodes. And then within that, there are three or op uh, four options. And the last one is the label size. And for label size, you want to uh, say you want to change label size in accordance to rankings for what measure? For in degree measure. So th those are steps allows you to create cleaner visualization. Now going back to the question that uh, was asked about how do you uh, kind of uh, do course correction for certain name entities that might have not been recognized properly, or in this example here, uh, there may be different posts uh, using different spellings or variations of the same name entity. For example, one post will say Federal Drug Administration as FDA abbreviation. Another post will use US FDA. And some other posts may actually spell out the full name. So how do we tell Visualizer to combine these nodes? Because they essentially represent the same uh, entity, the same organization. So we can do that in Gephi using this data laboratory feature. And because we want to combine nodes, we will go um, to the nodes tab here. Once we're in the notes section, uh, what you want to do to search for specific uh, name entities names, uh, make sure to in the drop down menu to say where you're searching, uh, what field you're searching in. And for Gephi, it's called label. This is what you actually see on the screen. So you choose the label in this drop down menu uh, and then type the keyword you're searching for. So in our case, there's 
node called FDA, was labeled FDA, and node was US FDA. So we can merge that. But, but before we even do that, we can go further. We can say, can we also find if there are nodes that spelled out Federal Drug Administration? Uh, and so this filter option in Gephi supports a Boolean uh, search or Actually, it's regular expression, what it's called. Uh, but uh, to use this Boolean OR that we're familiar with, you actually have to use the horizontal line operator, just like I show you on this slide. So you type FDA in the filter, horizontal line, and then the other va variable you're searching for. So I type food and drug administration as a phrase. And so now I found four no name entities, uh, then now we can group them together. To group it in Gephi, you just uh, select them uh, all, right click, and then in the context menu, there will be an option, merged nodes. And then the final step to say, hey, what's the new label for this merged node is gonna be? And you can choose uh, any of these four for, to keep my visualization you know, clear of clutter. So I, I prefer shorter labels. Uh, so FDA was informative enough for me. So I chose FDA and this is what happens. So all of the name entities and their connections now part of the same network. So remember I said name entities is not full proof. So you do need to uh, do some kind of data cleaning after you visualize it. Uh, you don't need to do this for all of the semantic nodes. They maybe most of them will have just one connection. Uh, you can sort it. Uh, so in data laboratory here, I'm showing you how you can click on the He header of this column called in degree, you can sort it by the most mentioned name entities. And within the uh, most mentioned entities, you can examine which one may be representing the same entities that you might want to group. So that's the general process. And, and on the same interface allows you to remove name entities that may be um, false positive or not relevant to your research. For example, there's an emoji of human that um, uh, was recognized as name entity person. Well, if it's not relevant, you can right click on that uh, row and you can delete it and it will disappear from your network. So that's how you essentially export two mode semantic networks and then uh, do additional data pro uh, processing in Gephi. Um, to, final, to finish my presentation on this, I just wanna um, highlight that um, now you can apply to mode networks for uh, both Reddit and Twitter data set. This is a new feature starting this week. Uh, to switch between network types, make sure to reset network file. If you already built networks for some, data sets and you want to switch to two mode networks, reset file, and then you rebuild it. For Twitter, there's even additional option for two mode semantic networks to build it either based on the Spacey li library that we use, or Twitter actually automatically pre-process each Twitter message and also incorporate name entities as a field. So we can use that option. And You have to test it, depends on the data sets you analyze and which one produce more accurate results. With Twitter, I found that they tend to detect fewer name entities, um, but slightly more uh, accurate, you know, cleaner, but you have to test with it. The advantage of using Twitter annotation, uh, which recognizes people, places, product, organizations, or other, those are five categories they recognize, it's just a bit faster because we don't need to do the analysis. It's already a part of your metadata. For Twitter data sets. And to demonstrate uh, another kind of visually how you can find groupings of nodes based on this um, name entities mentioned, I ran a, a data collection for Twitter data set using my academic track mentioning tweets um, either Ukraine in English or uh, Ukraine in, uh, in Cyrillic, um, Russian Cyrillic. And that was during um, and some uh, conflict uh, that was uh, on the rise this uh, past springtime. And so I found 68,000 um, tweets uh, that mention either of these keywords. And when I visualize it using cement, two mode semantic networks, I discovered uh, two clusters form. One was really around accounts that use, uh, talk about this conflict in, in Russian uh, language. So U Ukraine here, or in English, Ukraine. And so you can think about, imagine all kinds of analysis you can do with this type of um, networks. Now, I would like to quickly introduce the final topic for today's presentation. And this is a bonus topic. We didn't uh, plan for it, but uh, because many researchers were asking us, how do you detect uh, 
uh, potential automated accounts in your Twitter data sets, uh, we decided to integrate uh, a commonly used bathometer API, uh, which helps you to detect Twitter uh, bots um, accounts in your data set. But now you can do it in commun community. And so there are the, uh, I'm going to skip a couple of slides just to, to make sure we have enough time for Q&A at the end. But here I was just wanted to tell you that, uh, to remind you, I guess, there are all kinds of automated accounts, but not all of them bad. Uh, there are some useful ones that keep, uh, helps us to keep track of uh, updates, uh, you know, news stories, uh, uh, art uh, oriented bots. But the ones we're really concerned about usually in the research and society, the bad actors that essentially designed to expose private information or advance um, artificially invents some public policies or enlarge audience, artificial enlarge audiences for some people, uh, or just uh, share misinformation. So those type of bots we most concerned about. I'm gonna again, skip some of the slides, but here I wanted to show you that there are different approaches to automatically detect some of these accounts. None of them foolproof and the automated accounts bots are constantly improving. So it's um, harder and harder to detect them. But in generally, based on the literature, we see that the bot detection tend to be based on pictures, uh, profile pictures or pictures that have been shared by bots, based on the messages, the words they use, the links they share, uh, based on the uh, account characteristics, things like when they engaged, uh, um, the, even their usernames can be indicative of uh, their automation, as well as uh, network features, you know, who they follow, uh, who follow them back, uh, how central they are in the network, and so on. Um, so there are different, uh, like I said, approaches to detect it. There are also different libraries uh, that emerged over the years to help us as researchers to identify whether some of the content being pushed um, and artificially amplified by automated accounts. So to help you detect some of those accounts, uh, Tiago uh, Rivier, our data scientist at the Social Media Lab, will talk about how we can use Bathometer API uh, and how we can integrate it in community and analyze Twitter datasets within community, community that way. So Tiago, over to you. Thank you, Anatoly. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Tiago Rivero. Uh, as Anatoly said, I'm a data science sign, uh, analyst and uh, software and web developer for the Social Media Lab. Uh, let me just share my screen here so you can follow along with me. Okay, can, uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, all good. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to be talking about a new module uh, that the Communalytic has been working on to detect Twitter bots using a Bottometer API. So I guess the first thing I should cover is uh, what is Bottometer API? So uh, Bottometer API is a tool created by the Observatory of Social Media at Indiana University uh, that uses a machine learning approach to detecting bot-like behavior and automation on Twitter accounts. Uh, and what it does is it differentiates between different types of bot account behaviors. Uh, so the main six bot behaviors that Bottometer uh, recognizes and detects is uh, echo chamber, accounts that engage in follow back groups and share and delete political content in high volume, fake follower bots, bots purchased to increase follower accounts, uh, financial bots, bots that post using cash tags, self-declared bots, bots from a database called botwiki.org, uh, spammer bots, accounts labeled as spam bots from several data sets, and uh, other miscellaneous bots um, obtained from manual annotation and user feedback. Uh, we can provide this uh, link, Anatoly, how we do that. Um, so how does Bottometer differentiate between these six bot types? Well, Bottometer API uses, a mach uses machine learning models to determine how likely a Twitter account behaves like a bot. And it will generate these probability scores uh, based on the six specific bot behaviors uh, I just mentioned. It will also generate uh, an overall probability score that corresponds with the behavior or model uh, it is most confident that account is. Um, one option to access this, uh, this tool is to use their uh, web interface on their website. I can show you how it works. So uh, let's take a look at this, uh, this Twitter account called EarthquakeBot, who in his description says, 
uh, I am a robot that tweets about uh, any earthquake 5.0 or greater as they happen. So this is clearly a self-declared bot. Um, so let's see how Bottometer scores this bot. Um, there's a lot going on here, right? So all I did was I entered the account's name. I clicked on check user. And let's just take a look at the bot type scores here. So these are the scores that Bottometer assigned to this account. And these act as the probability scores I mentioned. So as you can see here, we have echo chamber one, so on, and the highest being uh, self-declared and other. Uh, so the likelihood of this bot being a self-declared or other bot, according to Bottometer, is much higher than the others. And it also assigns it an overall score. So this is the overall probability uh, of this account being a bot, which is very high, 4.2 out of 5. Now, uh, I also decided to do the uh, an analysis on the Social Media Lab's Twitter account. And uh, as expected, our uh, Twitter account is not a bot. The overall score here is 1.4 out of 5. And you can see the overall bot type score, the different bot type scores are quite low as well. Um, while Bottometer's web interface is easy to use, its major limitation is that it only allows you to check one Twitter account at a time, and it won't let you analyze um, multiple. So uh, what we did to address this limitation is we integrated Bottometer's API directly into Communalytic, so you can automatically check many Twitter accounts at once and uh, view these results within Communalytic. Uh, so uh, I'm going to show you how it works using one of my existing Twitter data sets in Communalytic. Uh, if you don't already have a Twitter data set uh, in your account, uh, we covered it in the third session of the bootcamp. So if you want to check that out, uh, you can. Uh, so, but once you have your Twitter data set as I have here, all you have to do is click, click on this check for Twitter bots option that's now available. Uh, once you do that, uh, you'll have two options on this uh, page you're redirected to. Um, you'll have analyze top 100 accounts and uh, analyze all accounts within your data set. So as you see here, I have 357 accounts uh, in my data set of 469 records. Um, one thing to note is that uh, you do not require a Bottometer API key if you want to perform the first analysis. So if you perform a, a, a Twitter collection on Communalytic, you can perform this analysis right out of the, right out of the gate, do it. Um, however, if you want to analyze all of the accounts within your data set, you'll have to provide us uh, a bottom of your API key, which I'll be showing later how to uh, how to get one of those. Um, but for now, just for demonstration purposes, I'm going to be showing what happens when you do analyze top 100 accounts. Uh, similar to toxicity analysis, uh, you'll see a Twitter bot analysis progress, and you can see uh, it'll it's detecting out of 100 users. Once that's complete, you can leave this page if you want to come back later. Once it's complete then you should see this page. From here, you can view a table which contains the top 100 users that you just analyzed and all of their values. Uh, earlier, I showed you uh, how to analyze an account uh, using Bottometer's web interface. Um, they used a scale, I can actually bring it up here. They used a scale from zero to five. Uh, it's a normalized scale. But in Communalytic, uh, we are using Bottometer's API which gives us access to a more research-friendly probability scale that goes from zero to one. Zero being uh, the probability an account uh, is not a bot, and one represents a high probability of the account being a bot. Uh, so you can see the difference here. Right? Um, you can sort this table by selecting onto the headers. Uh, so you could sort by each of the values generated by just pressing on the headers. Um, and you can also export this data with uh, the, the rest of your data set by just following this download link here. It'll bring you to here. You'll download a uh, CSV file and you can open it up in Excel or whatever program you use. And at the end of the CSV file, you'll see these uh, new columns that have bottom meter in front of them. This, represent, this represents all the values related to the, the bot analysis module. Um, so in the first column, let's take a look at uh, these rows. In the first column, we have bottom meter checked on. This is the time uh, at which Communalytic actually performed bot, uh, bot analysis uh, on that user. Um, and we also have in the second, in the second column here, uh, user status. So some users may have had their accounts suspended or privated. And if that happens, uh, Communalytic isn't able to perform bot analysis on, uh, on those specific users. So, it will give you the reason. So in this case, uh, this account was suspended here. 
and the rest of the values are not applicable. Um, however, if the account is available, then the rest of the values overall echo chamber that we discussed uh, will be available and visible there. Um, yeah, so now I'm gonna show you how to uh, get a bottometer API key so you could perform that second analysis on all of the users. So to request your own bottometer API key, you'll first have to go to uh, the Rapid API website. So Rapid API is a marketplace that allows you to subscribe to different API services. Uh, in our case, we're interested in the bottometer API. Uh, so first you'll need to create a free account by just signing up there with the sign up button. Uh, the easiest way to go through the process is to just sign up with the Google account. Um, and once you've gone through that whole process, um, you'll be taken back to the Rapid API homepage. Uh, if you don't get directed back to the bottom meter page, uh, you can just search it at the top here and then select uh, bottom meter pro. From here, uh, you'll want to select uh, your subscription that you want to the API. Uh, so you do that by selecting the pricing menu here uh, and you'll be directed to uh, this page. So on the pricing page, you're given the option between uh, the basic, the pro and the ultra plan. Each plan has a limited amount of users that it can check per day or accounts that it can check per day. So the basic 500, pro 2000, et cetera. Um, I wanna emphasize that uh, Communalytic is not affiliated with the bottom meter API team. So if you have any questions about their plans, uh, you'll have to contact them directly. Um, because each plan has a custom daily limit, uh, Communalytic keeps track of your bottom meter daily usage. Uh, so you don't go over your bottle meter uh, plan limit. Uh, in fact, the Twitter bot analysis module uh, will only use up to 80% uh, of your daily limit. So for example, if you have the, the basic plan, uh, it'll use 400 requests per day. And with the pro, uh, it'll analyze 1600 accounts per day. Uh, and yeah, so once you finish the selecting which subscription is uh, necessary for you, um, you'll now want to access your uh, bottom meter API key. So to access your key, you're just gonna wanna go up here to the My Apps menu. Uh, from here, you'll be able to access your dashboard and Rapid API creates a default application for you over here. You just wanna select this for the dropdown and then select security. So once you've done that, you should see your uh, application key here. Uh, and this is it over here. If you wanna make it visible, you just select this eye icon and then you wanna highlight all of it and copy it into your, uh, your clipboard. Uh, once you've done that, you wanna go back to Communalytic, um, open up your My Profile over here, go to the Access to My Profile page and under the API keys uh, section, you want to go to the bottom meter API row, select enter key, it'll open up a uh, enter bottom meter API key module and then you want to paste your API key here and then press submit. Uh, if everything uh, went well and you did everything correctly, you should be able to see your API key on the page. Uh, and once you've done that, um, also I just want to remind uh, you that the reason you might want to apply for your own bottom meter API key is when you want to analyze, analyze all accounts in a given data set where there's more than 100 accounts. Uh, now let's assume that you've already analyzed the top 100 accounts uh, just as I did, and you want to redo the analysis with all accounts in your data set. Uh, to do so, you'll go back to my data, set, my data sets page and click on the check for Twitter bots on the data set in question. Um, this will take you uh, back to this page and uh, you're gonna wanna press reset analysis. So once you've done that, you'll be uh, offered both options and then we're gonna select the analyze all accounts tab uh, once we do that, we see now it's analyzing all of the users in our data set. Uh, you can leave this page, come back, and then once it's done, uh, you'll see the same page. Uh, one thing I want to bring attention to is we see here 356 out of 357 accounts from your data set were analyzed by bottom meter API. Uh, this is because one account in this data set in particular uh, was unavailable. Their account may have been suspended or private, so Communalytic couldn't perform bot analysis on there. Um, this table as well, anytime you analyze more than 100 users, uh, this table will show the top 100 users based on the overall score. So it'll grab the top 100 uh, accounts analyzed with the highest overall score. 
Um, to, uh, so that means you won't be able to view all of the accounts just in this table. So in order to view all of them, you'll have to go back and download the entire data set as before and open it in Excel or uh, whatever program like before I showed you. And um, yeah, that's the entire process of our new uh, Twitter bot analysis module. Uh, I should also mention that um, later on this summer, uh, we will be adding a feature uh, in our network analysis module where you'll be able to visually see where these bots are uh, within your network. Yeah, uh, Anatoly? Yeah, and that's everything. Thank you, that's great. And another feature, feature will allow you to upload your existing Twitter data set and mm -hmm. to run the bot detection on your own data sets. So yeah. that's also, stay tuned, coming later this summer. Philip, over to you. So thank you everybody for attending and thank you Anatoly and um, Tiago for your presentation. So overall um, in this series, what we've tried to show you is that this tool that we're developing is basically a Swiss army knife that uh, we've designed with many different features that you can use based upon the type of analysis and the type of research that you want to um, conduct. Um, and in the months to come, we'll be adding additional features like sentiment analysis and so on to um, this tool. Um, and we'll also be adding things like um, lesson plans so that you can include them in um, any classes that um, you might wanna teach using this tool in the future. So right now we're gonna open it up for general discussion about what we presented today or anything that you have regarding the tool as a whole. Um, feel free to uh, use your microphone.